estamos grabando. MP Constituents. Eh, lo que estamos viendo acá era, fue lo que vimos la semana pasada. Fue buena idea haberlo dejado en un Word y ahora lo podemos ir revisando como de a poquito. Y quedan las anotaciones puestas. Una vez que terminemos esto, por supuesto, yo se los entrego con las anotaciones hechas que, que ya tenemos. La semana pasada revisamos determiners. Quedamos entonces claros con un par de ideas. The existence of a determiner phrase. First of all, the second thing would be uh, that determiners can be divided into at least three different forms. The predeterminer, the, de the central determiner, and the post-determiner. We also, um, we also uh, saw the fact that noun phrases, they began with a determinative element, which can be which can be done by the presence of one single determiner or the presence of a determiner phrase. That's something else. Uh, what else? We reviewed the differences between central determiners, predeterminers, and post-determiners, but basically they were not that different. What we did was just reviewing this simple this simple chart i think with this one you're you have everything all the rest is just it's just a matter of of um theory i would say uh by uh, therefore i strongly recommend you to review this chart and this another one those are enough i think Then today we have to talk about uh, all the other uh, noun phrase constituents and we're going to probably finish today with theory and then we're going to just do analysis later on, okay? So this is not going to be that difficult. Um, recuerde que si tiene alguna duda o consulta, hágala de inmediato, no hay ningún problema, nos devolvemos, explicamos de nuevo, hacemos más rayitas, todo eso, ¿ya? ¿yeah? Así que eso. ¿Profe? Dígame. Eh, es que yo tengo una pregunta que soy de la sección 2 y, por ejemplo, la semana pasada también estaba esperando el link para la clase y no me llegó. Incluso hoy día por, tuve que consultar en el grupo de la generación por el link de esta clase porque tampoco me llegó y no soy la única, creo. Mira, no sé si orden, lo sube por... La orden de Roberto por correo, cuando digo Roberto me refiero al director del Departamento de Inglés de la UMCE, es que, te estoy mostrando, uh -huh. debido a que hay gente que aún no tiene eh, inscritos sus cursos, que los links de conexión a todas las clases sean enviados a través de Comunidad de Inglés. Comunidad de Inglés, como lo puedes ver, está a la izquierda. Y como puedes ver, el profesor Luis Ortiz, Cristian Sánchez, so and so forth, envían sus correos por allí. Entonces, ¿qué uh -huh. ocurre cuando uno envía un correo por aquí? uno lo envía a todos los estudiantes de la UNCE que estén inscritos en un campus, como puedes ver tú. Yeah. Therefore, si no te llegan, no estás inscrita en un campus. O sea, es que yo se supone que estoy inscrita en, en un campus y, como, y ya me aceptaron, se supone que en este ramo, entonces como que no sé, y no soy la única tampoco. Ya, yeah, es que lo hago como me lo pide Ro Sí, perfecto, entiendo tu problema. Yo te digo que lo hago como lo pidió el director, ¿cachai? Eh, uh -huh. Y si no le llega, entonces la única opción que veo probable es que, uno, no estés inscrita en un campus, porque entonces tu correo no estaría en la base de datos. Dos, que un enanito mágico haga algo raro y no, no, te, no sabría tener respuesta. ¿Ya? Eh, sí. Lo que podemos hacer es otra cosa, pues. Dame un segundo. Un segundo. El día es 19, creo. Uh -huh. Sí, exacto, el día 19. 19 del 10. Oh, ya estamos al 10. ¿eh? Esto es envío. Envío link a estudiantes 11. Le voy a preguntar a 
al Roberto, a Roberto o a Cristian, que cuáles son las nuevas órdenes de ellos, si es que ya podemos, por ejemplo, enviar los links de conexión, son los estudiantes que aparezcan inscritos en los cursos dentro de UCampus. Como que esa sería una, una solución al problema, ¿ya? Le voy a preguntar al Roberto y al Cristian. En la que tenga alguna respuesta, le aviso. Ya, ok, profe. Eh, gracias. Igual una pregunta, la clase anterior igual está grabada y la tiene en su canal, ¿cierto? Sí. Ah, ya. Ya, listo. Gracias. Okay. Ese canal me ha salvado la vida, profe. Sí, como que funciona grabar cosas. Eh... Sí, yo siento que es una buena ayuda. Si me la verdad es que no. sí. No sé, yo pa, cada vez que tengo una prueba, yo soy el tipo de personas que me rucheo así como todas las clases de una, así como para que se me metan en la cabeza antes de la prueba, y eso me ha resultado, entonces, no sé, hay algunas personas que entienden más así, así como viendo todas las clases como de una. Sí, está bien, como que funciona. El compañero quería decir algo. Incluso con sí. los compas de otras secciones que están con, con Pichi... Eh, le he pasado el link para que vea las clases porque igual siempre sirve como un sí. medio audiovisual para, para estudiar. Sí, mm. sí. Sin que le haya servido galeta. Por que, gracias, profe, por eso. Y si pudiéramos tener clases de otros lados sería bacán. Sería bacán tener un repositorio, así como cachar qué dice mm. el profe Pablo Corbalán respecto a esta cosa. Cachai, poner, leer, no sé, pues, ¿cachai? Sería, sería bacán. Es una buena idea. Estaría bonito eso. Me gustaría. Ya, oye, estamos grabando, estamos grabando hace rato. Eh, ¿Alguien más? ¿Algo antes de empezar? No, le damos, le damos. Ya, entonces, noun phrase constituents. Uh, ya, estaba hablando de qué? Vamos a hacer un resumen. Estaba hablando de noun phrases. En la clase pasada hablamos de la primera parte de una noun phrase, que es la determiner o determiner phrase o determinative position. Ahora vamos con la segunda parte, que son los pre-modifiers. Muy simple. Pre-modification comes from the idea of modifiers. I'm going to make this thing like smaller, I think. Eso. Entonces, en teoría, yo ocupo mi lápiz. Y con esta cosa no puedo dibujar y todo lo Eso. Entonces, eh, down phrase constituents, que idea of modifier. Modifier. Modifiers are optional. That's the very beginning. Uf. First of all, they are optional. They are optional elements, that is to say, you can erase them. In fact, you can erase them. Therefore, every single time that you have a noun phrase and then you are wondering where, it, where the noun hit is, you can actually tap all other constituents and then read it again. And if you can erase it, then it is not the hit, right? That's another way in which you can prove it. <clears throat> Modifier, they are optional, right? Modifiers can be erased. Modif modifiers can be separated into two of them. They can be pre-modifiers or they can be post-modifiers. If they are pre-modifiers, then what you have is that that modifier is placed before the head, the noun head. And if it is post-modifier, then it is placed after the head. That's simple. Okay, so now pre-modification means that all the items placed before the head other than determinatives are ah, cool. Therefore, therefore, determinatives, they aren't modifiers. That's weird. Okay, uh, let's remember that a noun phrase can be something like a box and inside of that box you will have the head, right? Like the central obligatory element and then in front of that you will have the pre-modifier and after that you can have a post-modifier or a complement. 
but at the very beginning you will have a determiner. Now they are saying all the items items placed before the head, right? Other than determinatives. Oh, so determinatives they can't be considered as pre-modifiers. Weird. Well, here we have a problem because uh, in some grammars they called uh, determinants as pre-modifiers, but in some others you have this problem, like they are making a difference between pre-modifiers and determinants. Where is that difference? The difference would be basically because uh, a determinant will specify a noun head, that is to say they will provide us the idea of definite definite or indefinite, right? Uh, meanwhile, modifiers, they will classify, right? So there, so there you have a difference, um, again, all over again. Okay, inside of a noun phrase, you have a head, which is in the middle of it, and then uh, before that, you will have modifiers, but not any modifier, but a pre-modifier. And after that, you will have another modifier, not any modifier, but a post-modifier. Also, they can also find, you can also find um, complements, right? But at the beginning of the noun phrase, you will find a determinative element, which can be a determiner or a determinist phrase, right? Because you just have place for one of them. Um, okay, then we have this, this definition. In this definition, they say pre-modification means all the items placed before the head other than determinatives. You see, in this definition, they are making, they, or they are stating the difference between pre-modifiers and determiners. Now, there is a difference, in fact, because determiners, they will specify the noun head, right, in the sense of definite or indefinite, right? So, all over again, last week, we were discussing that uh, and we said, um, or, or we proposed the existence of a definite noun phrase and indefinite noun phrases, right? And you can see that because of the presence of that uh, determiner, right? Meanwhile, modifiers, they will classify, therefore they will act as, as, as adjectives, most of them, right? Therefore, all over again. Pre-modification means all the items placed before the head other, other than determinatives, notably adjectives or adjective phrases and nouns. So as a pre-modifier, you can have an adjective, an adjective phrase, and a noun. So in the example, some furniture, I will do it, and we're going to mark this with another color, like with this weird rainbow thing like. Okay, so some furniture is a noun phrase, right? We know it's a noun phrase. And this noun phrase contains uh, a determiner, some, and then a noun head, and that's it. Some expensive furniture, on the other hand, is also a noun phrase. Uh, and it contains, again, the very same determiner and noun head, but also an adjective pre-modifier, and we know that. Then some very expensive furniture is also a noun phrase. And this noun phrase is being made up of a determiner. Then very expensive is an adjective phrase. And that adjective phrase is pre-modifying furniture, which is the head. <clears throat> then we have some very expensive office furniture is also a noun phrase. And then you have this, and then you basically have the very same idea, right? Adjective phrase, pre-modifier, and then you have this noun pre-modifier, and then you have this noun head. Now with this specific example, you might have one problem. The problem would be the idea of uh, office furniture. The problem with the words or the combination office furniture is the fact that they are both nouns, right? 
So uh, how can we state the difference between office furniture and, for example, ice cream? Okay, I'm going to try to explain this. Um, the fact that ice cream is just one lexeme, even though even though uh, it can it is made up of two different nouns, right? I'm going back to the idea of lexeme and the idea of one lexeme is uh, a unit which activates something in your head, and that idea, uh, therefore, that activation, uh, what you read, what you hear, right? The words, those words can be more than one, right? Like for example, ice cream. But on the other hand, you have office furniture. So the question is, is office furniture just one lexeme or two lexemes? The question then um, is meaningful for us because if it is two, if the answer would be no, they are two different lexemes, then the very first noun is a noun pre-modifier at the second is a noun here. But if you say no, both of them together, they just activate one idea in our heads, then what you have is just a single lexeme, therefore a noun here. How can I prove one or the other? Um, quite simple. I would say uh, the very first thing I'm going to do is asking myself if there's any other kind of furniture, like classroom furniture, can I find that? Or bedroom furniture, or, or um, I don't know, bathroom or whatever, something, right? Probably we can find some other examples. And then, then that would be the proof that you have two different lexemes. If you can't find it, then you have one single lexeme. Okay. Finally, we have this final example in which we have some very, very expensive office furniture. And this is a very big, big, noun phrase where we have some, we know that some is a determiner. We're going to write it down pre-modifier anyway, just for the sake of keeping our analysis model. Uh, and then we already know that furniture is, is the noun here, right? It doesn't, it doesn't change. Office is again, the same idea. It's a noun pre-modifier, but the question would be very, very expensive. Is it some very, very expensive office furniture or which way? Well, the question is, it's still the same is, okay, let's, let's take a look at the first very, uh, is it providing its information to furniture or to any other element inside of that noun phrase, right? Uh, I would say it is inside of very, very expensive, right? And then what, you, what we have is a, reduplic a reduplicative factor. This, that's something we will see later on, but, but it is important for you to know that there is a possibility for that. Okay, it's an adjective phrase and the whole adjective phrase is pre-modifier and the very first is an adverb pre-modifier and then the second is another adverb, adverb pre-modifier and finally expensive is our adjective Head. As a summary, then, as a summary, then, pre modifiers can be adjectives obviously. If we have adjectives, you can have adjective phrases. But also, you can have nouns. This is very, very relevant because um, if someone in the near, in the in the near future will say, "Okay, teachers, you know what? I think there's this noun phrase pre-modifying. There's another noun phrase. That's impossible. You can't have that. You can't have a noun phrase pre-modifying a noun phrase. Not in English, at least. Okay. Alguna pregunta respecto a los pre-modifiers? No, avanzo. 
Post modifiers, y aquí se nos pone entretenido. Post modifiers, noun phrase constituents. Okay, we're going to talk about post modification. That means comprising all the items placed after the head, right? And what we can find is the following. The very first of them is a prepositional phrase, quite obvious, right? So this is my noun phrase, obviously. This is my prepositional phrase post modifier. And inside of that, I would have this beautiful noun phrase complement. So far, the easiest. But then we have clauses. Okay, we have clauses. Okay, so what we have in here is the car standing outside the station. The car standing outside the station is a noun phrase. And inside of this noun phrase, I have standing outside the station, which is a non finite ing clause. Oh, so they have names. Yeah. Non-finite ing clauses. Is there? Are there any others? Yes, they are. Non-finite ed clause. Non-finite ed clause. The car is standing outside the station. The car is standing outside the station. And as you can see, standing outside the station is a clause. How can I know it, it, that that thing is a clause? Well, first of all, it contains a verb phrase. The presence of that verb phrase will provide a valency pattern. Right? In this case, is standing is my verb phrase verb. Outside the station is an uh, is a prepositional phrase adverbial, and then the station is inside of that. <clears throat> Why is it called non-finite ing clause? Well, basically because of that form, the ing form of the main verb. Then we have relative clauses: the car that stood outside the station. Again, another, another one. Right, that stood outside the station. Clearly, that's a clause. And now, what we have is the separation of it. And here we have something different. This is called a relative clause, right? Relative clauses, they have various names. One of them is adjectival clause. They can be called adjectival clauses basically because they function something like, or somehow like an adjective, providing more information about the noun head, right? On the one hand, adjectival clauses. They can be of two types, right? Okay, oh, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about relative clauses, but we're going to talk about them later on anyway, but okay. Um, Okay, so a relative clause is a clause which is being used as a post modifier in noun phrases, right? as it is a clause which is provided information about a noun, because of that reason, they are called adjectival clauses. Adjectival clauses. They are being made by using WH words, like for example, who, whose, when, 
where. And I, and I think what I think, but let, let's put that thing in between parentheses because I'm not that sure now, but apparently what, you can also find it. Apart from WH words, you can also use them with the conjunction that, like the one we have in our example, right? The car that stood outside the station. It is very relevant for us to understand that this, that is a conjunction. Therefore, their meaning in Spanish would be que, right? So every single time we have that que, therefore we have a relative clause. A that relative clause. So this one over here, we are going to call it that clause or that relative clause. Uh, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because next year, uh, next year you're going to review them like deeply, right? So then you will use the correct and appropriate names and all the different features and keys and all that, right? But for, no, for us, for us right now, that clause, that would be enough, okay? Good, so so far, so far, we have discussed the idea of post modification, and we have said that uh, instead of a noun phrase, you can find a prepositional phrase as a post modifier, which is the easiest. Then what you, then we can also find non finite clauses at least of two different types: the ing, the non finite ing clause, and the non finite ed clause. Basically, no problem, and then. The following would be relative clauses, also called um, adjectival clauses. Um, they can be at least of two different types, uh, WH relative clauses and that relative clauses. And finally, finally, we can find complementation. That is to say, an element which we cannot erase, otherwise we will lose a lot of meaning. Like, if, for example, I'm going to make the drawing a bigger can a, a bigger card than that and obviously then that is a prepositional phrase right because then is a preposition and that is it noun phrase complement now be very careful because the noun here is car and next to it we have this another element which is a prepositional phrase obligatory we cannot erase it why? Well, because of the concord, right? Because of the, I would say concord or, or the presence of the comparative adjective in front of pre-modifying that noun here, right? Bigger is requiring, I would say, the presence of that prepositional phrase. Therefore, you cannot erase it. Therefore, is a complement and not, and not a post modifier. Okay? ¿Algún problema hasta ahora? Profe. Dígame. Um, no entendí cuál es la relación entre las WH words con relative clause. La WH words y la relative clause means that every single relative clause will begin with a WH word. Right? Like, for example, the man who... Uh, okay, let me let, let, let's try to do some uh, one example of that. Give me a moment. Uh, okay, here we have an example. I've talked to the people who live there. Okay, so that's a sentence. Relative clauses normally act as a modifier in a noun phrase and gives information about the head or preceding part of the noun phrase, the antecedent. I talked to the people who lived there. Okay, so what we're going to do is the following is uh, separating this sentence into its phrases. Uh, the very first step we're going to do is looking for the main verb. The main verb would be, I've talked 
So have talk. Okay, so this is the verb phrase verb quite easily. This is my verb head. And right over here, I have my auxiliary verb pre modifier in front of that. I have the doer of the action, therefore, a noun phrase subject with a pronoun head. And then to the people who live, I talk to whom? To the people. To the people who live there. You see, is all of, all of it. I've talked to them, right? Them. And then them as a pronoun replaces the entire thing. Therefore, that thing is something like a noun phrase. Or just or at or at least just one single unit. I know that to the people who live there is a prepositional phrase, right? How can I know that? Well, because of the presence of the of this preposition too. Preposition yet. And this is answering a question of who, therefore, it's an object. <clears throat> By theory, I know that inside of every single prepositional phrase, I will have a preposition head and then something like a noun phrase complement. And I know that because the people who live there is a noun phrase complement. So all of it is a noun phrase complement. Complement means obligatory. I'm going to write it again. Complement equal equals obligatory. Okay, now what's inside of that noun phrase complement? The very first stuff I can see is a determinate B acting as a pre modifier, and then I have people, right, which is my noun head, and then I have who lead there, who lead there, who lead there is a WH. Relative clause. Is a WH relative clause. Why WH? Well, because, because uh, it begins with a WH word, which is who, right? This WH relative clause is acting as a post modifier, I think. Post modifier. Now, what's inside of it? Well, it begins here till here. The very first stuff I have is who, which is making reference to the doer of the action, in this case, people, right? Who, as it is making reference to people, therefore is acting as a pronoun. And if it is acting as a pronoun, therefore is a noun phrase, the doer of the action, which is a pronoun. Head, right? Then I have the action itself, which is lived. Verb head. And finally, another pronoun or adverb, I think. Let's take a look at that, just to make sure. Let's take a look at it. There, put the chair there. Okay, that's the very same position in which we have our example. The museum is closed today. We'll go there tomorrow. Okay, the very same position. There's there's that book you were looking for. Okay, that's not our position. Basically, it's an adverb. Right? So, there. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I have there, right? There was an adverb, therefore this is an adverb phrase, adverbial place made out of an adverb head. Alguna duda? No. No. Um, entonces, uh, who lived there? 
es una frase en sí misma y que se podemos dividirla entonces. Cuidado, es una cláusula en sí misma. Cláusula, perdón, sí. Porque tiene frases adentro, ¿sí? Las frases... Sí. Ya, ya, esa es la idea, sí, para no enredar. Primero, es una cláusula en sí misma, por lo tanto tenemos que decir de qué está hecha. Esa es la primera cosa. La segunda cosa, Julita... Eh, Julita es un post modifier. Eso quiere decir que lo puedo borrar. Ahora quiero que ustedes lean esta oración sin Julita y me digan si es necesario que esté allí o no. I've talked to the people. I've talked to the people. Pero si yo digo, I've talked to the people who live there, especifico mucho más, ¿es necesario que esté who live there o no? O si digo, I've talked to the people, ¿es suficiente? Yo digo que no es tan necesario. Ya. Eso es importante. Súper importante, porque las relative clauses I'm not saying that, I, I mean, Leach is not saying that in this definition, but a relative clause can be a post modifier, but it can also be a complement. Which means that a relative clause can be Let me, okay, there it is. Can be called a uh, restrictive. That is to say, obligatory. Which means complement. Or a relative clause can be non-restrictive. That is to say, optional, which means post modifier. ¿Se entiende? Sí, profe, clarito. Ya, bacán. En otras partes la llaman de otra forma, les dicen defining y non-defining. Ay, ¿cómo se, ¿cómo se? Soy súper malo con spelling. ¿De finding con in? Esa. ¿Puedo avanzar? Sí, creo que sí. Ya. Yeah. Complementation, okay. Uh, yeah, so we were talking about post modifiers, and inside of post modifiers, we have these prepositional phrases, the easiest one, non finite clauses, relative clauses, and then they call complementation. Then we defined relative clauses in a better shape, and now we're going to define the idea of complementation in a much more detailed manner. Um, Complementation. This is an ambiguous grammatical term, but the basic idea of a complement is that it is added to another constituent in order to complete the meaning. Okay, it is difficult, difficult, and ambiguous because complementation or the idea of complement are used under two different Um, levels, I would say. The very first of them is the valency pattern. Right? So we can find subject complement or object complement, but you can also find the concept of complementation or complement inside of noun phrases. Right? But not only noun phrases, also adjective phrases. And in Biber's term, uh, verb phrases. And 
prepositional phrases and in, in adverb, basically in every single phrase you can find one of these complements, okay? So be careful with that. Therefore, a complementation is an ambiguous grammatical term. The basic idea is that a complement will complete the meaning of a constituent, right? In this case, the noun here, if it is inside of a noun phrase or, for example, the subject at the clause level. The second, a construction such as a phrase or a clause which occurs with another constituent and can be said to complete the meaning or a structure of that element. Basically the same idea. So be careful with the idea of complement, okay? And, and be very careful with uh, the level, right? If you are talking about a clause level, then what you have is, is a clause complement. Therefore, what you have is a subject or an object complement. But if you are talking about phrase levels, then what you have is a noun phrase complement or what we have already uh, discussed. Okay, let's talk about heads. Uh, alguna duda de determiners, three modifiers, post modifiers or complement antes de hablar de head? No? Okay. Okay, this is basically very simple. Uh, noun heads, they, okay, nouns can have different uh, specifications, I would say, or they can be specified by using certain ideas. And one of them is the idea of number. So it is the name for the contrast between singular and plural, a contrast in English grammar affecting not only nouns, but also pronouns, determiners, and verbs. Therefore, we have singular pronouns, singular determiners, singular nouns, singular verbs, and we have plural oh, all of them. The singular form of nouns is the unmarked and most common form. When I say unmarked, unmarked form, unmarked word order, unmarked lexeme, this means no change. We can even state base form. So for example, the unmarked, unmarked, version of uh, a noun would be it's singular right for example boy boy is the unmarked version and boys would be the marked version right so this one is unmarked and this another one is marked That's the marked version. The singular form of nouns is the unmarked and most common form. And plural nouns are formed from singular by, by inflectional, inflectional change. We know that is the famous Z1. Normally the addition of a suffix. We know that. Not all, not all of them because we have irregular plurals, right? Noun head. Plural, native English and plurals buried from other languages. Ah, we can have, we can have plural forms, right? Uh, from words which are native from the English language or buried from other languages. We can also have regular and irregular plurals. And native English, a small number have irregular plurals. Okay, so in English, they have very few. I mean, the irregular plural number, uh, the irregular plural nouns are very few in numbers. That's well said. The irregular plural nouns, they are few in numbers, at least in comparison to regular plurals. Um, okay, here I have this summary. So you can create irregular plurals by changing a vowel, right? Man, men, woman, woman. Adding R, like in child and children, and EN, right? Or with voicing, the last consonant changes to B. Yeah, because the voiceless maybe a dental fricative. When you voice it, mm. then you create the regular plural, like for example, in calf 
and calves, shelf, shelves, knife, knives, feet, feet, and so on and so forth. Okay, but you have so these are other differences. ¿Alguna duda? Estas son formas de irregularidad en, en inglés. Nada tan relevante, en verdad. Okay, noun heads. Uh, yeah, we have nouns that are being borrowed from other languages, like these ones. I won't say much about that, just for you to know. Noun head, zero plural, do not change. Ah, yeah, we have zero plurals, like those, and probably you already know them. The sign of a zero plural is that the same form can be used with singular and plural concord. Ah, okay, this is interesting. Uh, it is interesting because it is inter interesting because as fish is, an, is a zero plural, therefore you don't have any change it won't change in any possible way, then the only manner in which we can understand it as a singular or a plural form will be its concord, right? Just the same as in over there. But that's it. Okay, genitive cases. This is the last part we're going to see about noun phrases, quite glad. So we have lots of times, uh, so we can do some analysis later on, probably on Wednesday. Okay, uh, the genitive case. Historically, English had case for nouns like the nominative and the accusative cases of pronouns. Okay, when, when I say case, I'm talking about uh, the possibilities of certain languages that they had or they still have in which you change the way in which you are going to write certain words let's talk about words depending on its position therefore you will have positive pronouns positive uh, positive pronoun personal pronoun relative pronoun and so on and so forth right so in english we have uh in old english historical historical english we have uh for uh we have cases for nouns for example, the nominative and the accusative. Nominative would be he, and the accusative form would be him. Therefore, making this different or stating this difference between personal pronoun, therefore nominative pronoun, he, and object pronoun, therefore accusative pronoun, therefore object pronoun, him, right? But in English, we still have one case, functioning, which is the genitive case. The genitive case is um, a noun phrase inside of a noun phrase, and that noun phrase can perform two different roles, right? Okay, so a genitive case is a NP inside a NP, and that's it. They can have two roles they can be a determiner or they can be a pre-modifier <clears throat> right if the Genitive phrase, the genitive phrase is a determiner, then it is called specifying genitive phrase. If it is a prebotifier, then it is called a classifying. Genitive phrase. Let's see that. A genitive phrase as a determiner. They usually fill this lot of determiners in a noun phrase. That is to say, they specify the reference of the head noun. That is to say, the girl's face is a noun phrase, right? 
And inside of this noun phrase, the girl's phrase, we have a genitive phrase, right? And in its analysis, I'm going to do it right over here. Okay, the girl's phrase. Um, okay, so this is a noun phrase. I know that phase is the noun head, and I'm then I'm, now I'm going to ask myself. Uh, it answers the question, who's X? Oh, okay, so I'm going to ask myself, who's phase? The girl's phase. Okay, so with that, I know that girls is a determiner, is acting as a determiner, right? Specifying, therefore, and now, as I know, as I know that there can only be one place for a determinative element, what I have to do is enclosing that another determiner inside of this genitive phrase, right? And it's, I'm saying now that this genitive phrase is a premodifier. Inside of this genitive phrase, what I have now is a determinate premodifier and girls. Girls is a noun here. And that's it. Queda claro? Profe, entonces en ese caso, girls eh, se forma como una sola, un solo elemento. Girls es solo un elemento. Piénsalo mm -hmm. si lo analizáramos morfológicamente. Diríamos que esto es complex y estaría hecho del free morphing girl y del bound morphem suffix inflectional Z3. Pues así. ¿Cachai? Que por eso se habla de caso. No es que se le pegue algo, sino es que al sustantivo, al aparecer en ese lugar, sufre un cambio morfológico. Vale, profe. Entendido. Ya. Yeah. Entonces, genitive case is one of the is the last remaining case in the English language, and it will produce what we call genitive phrase. Genitive phrase. I haven't said that. Genitive phrase. Therefore, g. So a genitive phrase is the last remaining case within the English language. The genitive phrase will perform two different roles inside of a noun phrase. It will perform the role of a determiner if the GP answers the question whose, right? Like the example we already analyzed, the girl's phase, right? If the girl's phase, whose phase? The girl's. Therefore, the girl's is the genitive phrase pre-modifier, acting as a determiner, right? Uh, the genitive acts as the head of its own noun phrase, which acts as the determiner for the whole noun phrase. These are people's feelings. Okay, here we have another another example of a genitive phrase, okay? So first of all, I would say that this, this is the noun phrase. Let's imagine this is something like a subject. The final noun would be the noun head. Not always, but in most cases. Now I'm going to ask myself, whose feelings, decent people's, right? 
Therefore, this is a genitive phrase acting as a determiner pre-modifying feelings. And inside of it, I have decent, which is an adjective pre-modifier of peoples, which is the noun here. Got it? ¿Queda claro la forma del análisis? Profe, ¿cuál es la diferencia con la de arriba? ¿Por qué es determinante? Ah, porque arriba no colocamos que esa genitive phrase mm -hmm. está actuando como un determiner. Mm -hmm. Porque responde a la pregunta whose. Entonces son la misma forma, solo que... Sí. Yeah. Ya, veamos la de abajo. Interesante que un interesante que una genitive phrase, una genitive phrase que actúe como determiner, o sea, una specifying genitive phrase, puede ser transformada en una prepositional phrase. Como se ve acá. These and people's feelings puede ser transformado en the feelings of decent people. Después van a cachar por qué es importante. Se transforma. Puedes decir de las dos formas, ¿cierto? Pero porque te lo permite. ¿Qué es lo que lo permite? Porque te lo permite. Porque decent people es un determiner que responde a la pregunta de whose. ¿Cierto? The feelings of decent people también responde a la pregunta whose. Por eso permite el cambio de una genitive phrase a una prepositional phrase. Por otro lado, a genitive phrase as a modifier. In contrast to specifying genitives, the previous slides, classifying genitives, they classify the reference to the noun. Therefore, they act like pre-modifiers. Right? So I'm going to... Right? Like a pure pre-modifier. Something, something like, something like an adjective. Therefore, they don't answer to the question whose, but to the question what kind of, right? So, specifying genitive, genitive as determiner. Classifying genitive, genitive as modifier. If I read several hours later, the birds, the birds relief donor arrived at the station. Voy a hacer el análisis de eso. Several hours later, the bird's relieved owner arrived at the station. Y ahí voy a buscar el verbo que es arrived. ¿A dónde llegó? At the station. Esto es una prepositional phrase, adverbio de lugar. Y sé que at the station, como toda prepositional phrase, tiene un noun phrase complement adentro. Several hours later, the bird's relieved owner the bird's relieved owner. Several hours later, he arrived at the station. Listo, entonces se separaba aquí. ¿Cierto? Y eso es un several hours later. Es un when, ¿cierto? ¿Lo podría mover o no? The bird's relieved owner arrived at the station several hours later. Sí, es una verbia, entonces. Mm -hmm. Several hours Later, several hours later. ¿Cuál es el head ahí? Tabeludo. Several hours later. Horas es el más importante, ¿no? Hours. Y como tiene una S, y en inglés solo los nouns pueden ser plurales, esta cosa debería ser una noun phrase. Listo. Veamos entonces. The bird's relieved owner. Ya, ahí tengo mi genitive. 
Entonces me pregunto, The Birds Relieved Owner, ¿Who's Relieved Owner o What Kind of Relieved Owner? ¿A qué hace respuesta a eso? Quiero saber si ahí termina, yo sé que ahí termina. The birds is specifying or classifying. Entonces me pregunto, who's relieved owner? The birds relieved owner or what kind of relieved owner? The birds relieved owner is who's relieved owner. Hago una prueba más. The relieved owner of the bird. Relieved owner of the bird. The relieved owner of the bird. A relieved owner of a bird. Si sí me funciona. Entonces, esta cosa es un genitive phrase acting as a determiner and it is, is, it is pre modifying. Inside of it, I have the determiner, the, and birds is the noun here. Relieved, relieved is an adjective. And that adjective is pre-modifying owner, which is the noun head. Arrived is the verb head, and then add is a prepositional phrase, therefore preposition head. Next to that, the noun phrase complement. D is a determiner pre-modifier. Station is a noun head. And now here we have Several hours later. Estoy casi seguro que several es un determiner. ¿Cómo lo sé? Porque hace referencia a un número. Determiner, muchas gracias. Todo lo que haga referencia a un número y que esté al principio de una noun phrase debería tender a ser un determiner. As is by noun head. Ah, bizarre. Noun head. And later, debe ser algo así como un adverb. Y aquí, por supuesto, empezamos a encontrar cosas raras que van a encontrar en la teoría. Adverb. Do you see that? Eso. Veamos la de abajo. His hair felt like a bird's nest. His hair felt. Ahí está. Ahí está. His hair. Entonces, este es mi verb phrase verb. Esta es mi. His hair is a noun phrase subject. His hair. Esto es un determiner. Y here es un noun head. Felt es un verb head. Aquí hay algo nuevo. Like a bird's nest. Eso es una subordinate clause. ¿Hemos hablado de lo que es una subordinate clause alguna vez o no? Alguna sí, vez lo menciona. Sí, es una cláusula que se le pega a otra cláusula más grande y que comienza con un subordinador. El subordinador es like. ¿Cuál es el subordinador más famoso? Because. Por si acaso. Como digo, subordinate clause is head felt like that. Así, así se sintió. Así, de esta forma se sintió eso. Esto es un complemento del sujeto. Muy bien, porque no hay más unidad. Y como digo cláusula, digo que adentro hay frases. Tengo esta frase. A bird's nest. Tengo una noun phrase. Está raro esto porque yo diría que es un sujeto. No lo sé, qué raro. La vamos a dejar ahí en pregunta porque no es interesante. Lo que es interesante es lo que está dentro. Yo sé que nest en esa noun phrase es el noun head. 
pero birds, ¿a qué responde birds? Uh, ¿Whose nest o what kind of nest? Funciona como adjetivo ahí. Excelente, entonces lo que tengo aquí es una genitive phrase, three modifier y adentro tengo un noun head. Y al lado de eso, tengo mi determiner free modifier. Les pido mucho cuidado porque lo que acabo de hacer creo que pasó piola y nadie me dijo nada. Pero mucho cuidado, cáchense. Ya, acá. Miren esto de aquí. ¿Sí? Aquí yo digo que la genitive phrase es de birds, las dos juntas. ¿Sí? Acá abajo digo que la genitive phrase es solo birds. Y dejo A afuera. ¿Alguien cacha por qué lo hice así? ¿O cree saber por qué lo hice así? Porque el es, es finite y en el A es non finite. Almost, pero it has to do with this another idea, I think. Acuérdense que una noun phrase modifier, modifier o complement determiner. Una noun phrase solo permite una cosa, un ítem ahí, como determiner. O sea, podrías tener un artículo y si tienes más de uno, tienes que tener una determiner phrase. ¿Sí? En el primer ejemplo, the bird's relieved owner, como bird's es specifying, o sea, está actuando como determiner, por obligación se come al artículo que está delante y lo junta con él. ¿Sí? Porque solo puedo tener una unidad como determiner. ¿Sí? Por eso es de birds. Y en la segunda, como birds es modifier, ahí puedo dejarla sola como pre-modifier y ese A queda como determiner y la teoría me lo permite. Queda claro. Espero que sí. No es tan difícil, porque estos ejemplos son para cabros chicos, pero cuando lo veamos en la vida real puede que estemos peludos. Lo vamos a revisar igual. Tranquilidad. Eh... Bueno, es lo mismo. Esto lo podemos ver después. Por la hora, son las cinco y media, nos quedan diez minutos y quiero... Grabo, grabé. Cierro. Gente, ¿tenemos algunas oraciones que revisar o no? Faltaba la 3, no va. Ya, dame un segundillo. Esta cosa monstruosa de acá, ¿esa? Sí, la, la fea. Ya. ¡Ew! Ya, pum, démosle. Está terrible grande. According to a database prepared by the OECD, an intergovernmental research group spending by subnational governments in Latin America is equal to only 6% of GDP compared with almost 10% in the Asia Pacific region and 12% in Europe and North America. According to a database prepared by the OACD, esa cosa se mueve, ¿cierto? According to a database prepared by the OACD, ¿la puedo, ¿la puedo poner acá al final o no? ¿Qué dice la gente ahí? Sí, una verbia. Está, ahí tenemos uno. Ya estamos. 
an intergovernmental research group spending by subnational governments in Latin America is equal Espérame. Esa coma de aquí me mete caleta de ruido. ¿Hasta dónde dejaron la parte que se movía? Ya, yo creo que es esto. According to a database prepared by the OECD, an intergovernmental research group, yo creo que llega hasta acá. Yo creo que llega hasta ahí, chiquillo. Hasta aquí. Entonces, and according to a database, According to a database. According to, creo que es una preposición, la buscaron. According to, es una preposición. Preposition. Muy bien. Sí. Esto es una preposición o phrase. Que se mueve. Prepositional phrase, according to a database prepared by the OECD, an international research group, hasta acá atrás. La voy a ir cortando. According to a database prepared by the, a database preparado, according to a database prepared by the OECD, creo que es así. Y esta sería una non-finite ID clause. Y luego tengo mi VP, B, preparado por la OSB, un grupo de investigación intergubernamental. Boom. Entonces, preposition. Eh, noun phrase complement. Y luego tengo the OECD. Y aquí tengo mi noun phrase in a position. Entonces, mi análisis quedaría así. Quedaría preposition head y luego esto es una noun phrase complement que tiene a determiner pre modifier y luego tengo database noun head y luego tengo prepared by the OECD an intergovernmental research group. Creo que eso, no estoy seguro, aquí me voy a estar carriendo. Creo que eso es una non finite, non finite ED clause que sería a database complemento no está raro eso eso está raro ya pero supongamos que es así luego tengo prepared adentro que sería mi verb head no mi verb phrase verb con un verb head preparado por ellos entonces por ellos. Eso es una prepositional phrase object que tiene una preposition by y la noun phrase complement the determiner premodifier o ECD. Eso es un noun head y al lado an intergovernmental research group. Eso es una noun phrase Post modifier porque es un afterthought de la cosa que está delante. Que tiene un determiner and pre modifier intergovernmental termina en AL. Eso es una, un adjetivo. Y research group. Research es un noun. Pre modifier y group sería mi noun head. Eso. Spending by subnational governments in Latin America is 
equal to only 6% of GDP. Creo que ahí, coma, también puedo cortar. El gasto, spending, el gasto by subnational governments in Latin America is equal to only 6% of GDP. Entonces yo diría que acá lo que tenemos es eso, eso, ¿cómo es el gasto? Es igual a oh, GDP, creo que hasta aquí. Ya. ¿De aquí qué es lo que podríamos hacer? Bueno, lo del principio, pero lo de acá atrás lo tenemos que ver después. Ya, pero lo vemos ahora. The spending by subnational governments in Latin America. Spending, spending. Ese sería el gasto, el gasto. O sea, sería una nominalización. ¿Qué significa nominalización? Nominalization. What does it mean? It means when you use something as a noun. Therefore, you made a change. So, spend would be the verb and spending would be a noun. I think, I think. Um, therefore, this is a noun phrase, not a verb phrase or a clause. It's a noun phrase. Um, noun phrase, I would say, subject, I think, and then spending would be my noun head. Spending by subnational, el gasto de quién? De todos ellos, no? Eh, Podría estarme carleando chiquillos también. Veamos, primera opción. Spending by subnational governments in Latin America. Okay, so this is a prepositional phrase, no question about that. And as, as, as I said, this is a phrase. Is a post modifier and inside of it, we have the preposition head by and then the noun phrase complement, right? This noun phrase complement. Subnational governments in Latin America. Subnational governments in Latin America. Here we have another prepositional phrase in Latin America with its noun phrase complement. With its noun phrase complement. So I have preposition hit by subnational is an adjective. Let me, I'm going to move this a little bit. Okay. Uh, by subnational, that's an adjective. Pre modifier. And then I have governments, that's a noun head quite easily. And then in Latin America, it's quite obvious this is a prepositional phrase. Uh, post modifier with in is a preposition head. And then Latin America is my noun phrase complement. Latin America. Capital letters, both of them. Therefore, just one single. It's a name, and that's a name means a single lexeme. So noun head. Here now I have verb phrase. Verb, verb head is equal. Equal is an adjective. Ah, uh, esto no lo hemos visto. No tenemos que ver después. Esto es una adjective phrase. Creo que es un subject complement. Tiene una adjective head, y luego de un adjective head podemos tener una prepositional phrase complement eh, en una adjective phrase ¿sí? eso no lo hemos visto, lo tenemos que ver después pero ya se lo aviso donde to sería mi preposition head y luego tendría mi noun phrase complement only 6% only, creo que only o es un adverb o es un determinant The only person, ninguna de las dos me caí, pero. Oh, espérame. Only, adjetivo, delante de un noun. Only, adverb, used to show that something is limited to no more than only available. Only cost, only scratch. Es un adverb. A una conjunction. No, porque no está uniendo nada. 
Ya, entonces, dos opciones. ¿Es un adjetivo si está delante de un sustantivo o es un adverbio que indica cantidad? 6%. Dígame. Es adverbio, profe. ¿Cierto que sí? Porque delante tiene un número. Sí, entonces, noun phrase, esto sería only, sería mi adverb, pre-modifier, y aquí, interesante, si se dan cuenta, puse noun phrase, ahí, complement, pero aquí no veo ningún noun. Pero ese 6% está reemplazando a alguien, ¿cierto? Is equal to only 6%. Ese 6% nombra un grupo de cosas. Entonces ahí hay un número en enumerator ocupado como head adentro de una noun phrase porque lo están ocupando ese número como pronombre. Tras de él tengo of GDP que es una prepositional phrase post modifier que tiene of como preposition head, y luego, por canónico, noun phrase complement, y adentro tiene GDP, que es una sigla, por lo tanto, algo así como un pronoun, therefore, un noun. Eso. Estamos en la hora, chiquilla. Eso, nos queda un cachito y eso. Chicos, ¿ustedes tienen este archivo como actualizado o no? No, solo el, el se esta, esta oración. Ya, se lo mando al tiro. Denme un segundito, no me vayan a cortar. ¿ya? Para que sigan trabajando los otros. Déjame. Dejo de, ya. Espérenme un poquitito. Un campo. Un campus. UMCE, UCampus UMCE, Morfo, Grupo 2, Correo, Envío Correo, Tema, Exercises, Adjunto, Selección, Archivo, Dropbox Universidades, UMCE, Morfo, Ejercicios, 1 Análisis, adjunto a todos los alumnos y en correo. Ya gente, en su correo está lo que hicimos hoy día, eh, lo, estos, estos análisis, y les pido que continúen trabajando, dejé tres más allí. ¿ya? Nosotros nos tenemos que juntar qué día, el miércoles, ¿cierto? El miércoles. Para el miércoles necesito que avance todo lo que pueda en esos análisis y esté listo para poder mostrar lo que hizo. Me refiero a que, que ojalá le pueda sacar un par de fotos y las podamos compartir en la pantalla y vamos revisando qué es lo que hicieron, ¿ya? Eh, eso, ¿alguna duda? Eh, no. Mientras la hagamos, ¿se la podemos, si llegamos a tener dudas, ¿se las podemos mandar? Sí, Como... yo mañana voy de corrido con la UTLA todo el día, entonces si te ah, corres, ya. voy a responder en la noche. O sea, va a ser casi igual que la veamos el miércoles. Ah, mejor anotarlas por ahí el mismo miércoles. Sí, pero estén vistos como para sacarles fotos, así como que hagan las cosas en un papel, le sacan una foto y la tengáis ahí como para compartir en la pantalla. Ya. Yeah. Y ahí podemos ir, le tiramos lápiz y vamos revisando. Eso. ¿Alguien más alguna duda? <susurra> Eh, harta materia este semestre. Esta parte nomás, si salimos, salimos de esto y nos vamos por un tubo. Es solo esta parte. Tenemos prueba el 5 de noviembre. ¿eh? Ojo. Sí, no, no te... ¿Ya? Eso, nos vemos. Ya, profe. Gracias. Cuídense mucho. Muchas gracias, profe. Chau, chau. Se cuida. Gracias, profe. Chau, chau. chau.